Welcome to the Grace Hour, everyone. Happy New Year. And uh, we're starting off this year, 2023, with a program about the devil. That's right. We're going to talk about Satan today. I'm Pastor Steve Andrelonis. With me today in the studio is Pastor Ronaldo Brown. And uh, this is a program that, uh, you know, dives into the believer's daily challenges and helps them learn things in a practical way. So it is very practical uh, to know who your enemy is. Uh, and uh, he's defined for us. And we're going to go over some things about uh, some things that we've learned uh, from the scriptures primarily, but also uh, from personal experience in, uh, experience in witnessing just the activity of evil in uh, various places. And um, how familiar are you with this? It does say in the scriptures that you should be uh, not so familiar with evil. You know, you don't want to be so uh, familiar with it that you uh, uh, know too much about it, but you shouldn't be naive either. And so our purpose uh, for this program today is to uh, talk about Satan, uh, give you some scriptural foundation for who he is, uh, talk about the nature of him as a being and his, uh, for lack of a better word, personality, because uh, it's like kind of interesting. He's a being, he's an angelic being. Uh, is he a person? He's not a human person, but he definitely has personality. And uh, so I'm going to let Pastor Ronaldo uh, lead off with some of this uh, discussion about uh, the personality and who he is, and uh, and we'll see where this takes us in this discussion today. So thanks for being with us. Thanks for being a part of the Grace Hour audience. And remember, if you miss any part of this, you can go to uh, YouTube and uh, gracehour.org and Facebook and see uh, the, re the replay of this. It'll be archived at a certain point today. So thank you. Pastor Ronaldo. the personality of the devil. Uh, well, you made a great point there. You, you mentioned the activity of evil and the devil. And for many people's minds, they're the same thing. Um, there's a lot of confusion about the person of the devil. The Barna Group just did a survey recently. They asked uh, roughly 2,000 evangelical Christians in America about the devil. And 62% of them believe that the devil is the symbol of evil. And not an actual individual or person, but just whenever you want to speak about something being evil, he's kind of the face of evil but not a person. So it's kind of like, okay, when you do wrong, he's a symbol. So there's a lot, even among the church, there's a lot of disbelief and misunderstanding about the devil. Uh, C.S. Lewis said it like this. He said, the two great errors concerning the devil are, number one, the disbelief that he doesn't exist. And he called that person, I think it's in screw tape letters, he called that person a materialist. And then he said, those who believe but have an inordinate amount of attention paid to the devil. They kind of fixate on him. And he called those magicians. And that tends to be the two extremes of Christianity. You have a lot of Christians who live like there is no devil. And you have a lot of Christians that all they talk about is the devil behind every door, the devil in this. And it becomes kind of charismatic and demonstrative and even borderline cartoonish that there's a devil involved in everything. And both extremes are wrong. But that's the heart of man in John 13. Wash me all over, don't wash me at all. There's a devil in everything. There's a devil in nothing. I, I think a good balance would be, and this is a great foundation for the show, is Romans chapter 16, verse 19, that we can be wise to the good and simple to the evil. The word there for simple, it means unmixed. It means I'm not ignorant of it, but I'm not focused of it. I'm not afraid of it, but I'm aware of it. It's kind of like when you walk outside and there's the possibility that you could experience crime. There's a possibility that you could experience mayhem. You don't walk out the house with that mindset, but you're mindful. And that's a great way to put it. We as Christians, we don't have a mindset towards evil, but we're mindful of it. We know that there exists and we know that there's a devil. It shows we know that there's a God. And I think the lack of understanding about this person, and he is a person, the devil, the lack of understanding about him, the ignorance about him, is why there's so much disbelief in him. So I was thinking in terms of um, this word personality we're talking about today. Uh, when you, if you don't see Satan as a person, then it's hard to ascribe the characteristics that people say that he has. So let's define what a personality is. Um, a personality, by definition, is a, 
amalgamate of consistent characteristics that a person displays over a period of time. And we begin to ascribe that this is like, okay, he's loud today. He's been loud for 10 years. Okay, so being loud is part of his personality. So when you look at a person's personality, what are their consistent characteristics? The greatest measurement we have of the characteristics or personality of the devil is the Bible. The Bible gives us the biggest historical consistency about his character that we can find anywhere else. And when you read Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11, in Revelation chapter 12, verse 9, there's a specific word that kind of describes what Satan does. It is deceive. He deceives. Now, when someone is able to deceive, it implies creative design because deception requires a, a methodology, a, a trap, an organization, a plan, designing a way to entrap someone. So when you say someone's a deceiver, they have a creative ability to design. If they have a creative ability to design, that is the product of intelligence. The person's intelligent. They can design something. And if they're intelligent, you cannot subtract intelligence from personality. And when you study the, the life and the exposure of Satan scripturally, you will see very, very clearly, and we'll break some of this out today in the program, you'll see very clearly he has a personality, he has a character because he is a person. And not to be scared of him, but to be mindful. I don't want to walk in fear, but I want to walk in wisdom. And the verse that keeps ringing in my head is Romans 16, 19. I'm wise to the good, and I'm not ignorant, but I'm, I'm simple to it. I'm not mixed with it. I'm aware of it. And I think that's a great posture for the Christian. C.S. Lewis got it right. I got to be careful. There's got to be balance for me. And uh, let's just think about, uh, let's uh, put, okay, so he has personality. Yes. As you said. Let's, uh, let's just let the scriptures tell us a little bit about him. He was, I think that maybe mystifies some people, or maybe it's just the, sure. the use of the word anointed. Which means that, uh, you know, Ezekiel 28 says, you anointed cherub. Mm -hmm. It's addressing this person. So anointed cherub was Lucifer, anointed to a specific kind of role in the creation that God gave to him. Uh, anointed as much as Saul, the original king of Israel, yeah. was anointed. And uh, so did the devil have a good beginning? He had a... Uh, a uh well what, what what could it be he could he had a, a origin and that origin was unmixed and simple mm -hmm. uh, but iniquity was found in him but yes. he was anointed he was touched by god made by god positioned by god equipped by god for a certain responsibility mm -hmm. that according to ezekiel was near uh, the throne of God, near the uh, government of God, where God, did, just as Saul was anointed to be the first king. And uh, we know that Saul, when he was anointed, he was given a new heart mm -hmm. and became a new man. Yes. Satan was not given a new heart. He was not made a new man. Satan was made uh, for what he was. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, and we can only speculate, uh, but for some reason, iniquity, uh, a pride of of um, a pride of his design swallowed him. Hmm. Could you talk about that? For instance, um, that's a good point, Pastor Steve. Uh, that iniquity, we've been taught in our ministry that that is the emotional rebellion. So I am of the mind that because of the responsibilities that are described in Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28, and the way in Acts 2.23 and Ephesians 1.4 there was a plan, it is conceivable to believe that at some point he became in some part aware of God's plans mm -hmm. as they were unfolded in eternity past. And he had a, some kind of a reaction. That's the rebellion. It. And that's the rebellion. He was, it's, it's amazing when something gets in your heart, the spirit of rebellion gets in your heart. It does something to you. And he is a created being. And let's back up a little bit. So we want to establish that Satan is not equal with God. Mm -hmm. He's not the ant antithesis of God. But he's a created being. He was created. Uh, Ezekiel 28, 15 brings that out. He was part of the angelic realm, part of the angelic content. Um, um, he was uh, created with responsibilities. Uh, in Job 1, 12, he has limitations. He's not God's equal in 1 John 4, 4. So he's not omnipresent. He's not omniscient. He's not omnipotent. Okay, so there's a limitation. 
I like how John Wesley says it. He might be the devil, but he's God's devil. So this whole Hollywood idea of good versus evil, God versus the devil, is really not a fair fight because mm. God is not created and the devil was created. And he's a, a created individual, which brings us back to the fact that he has a personality because he's a person. He's a created being and also a spirit being. And Ephesians 2.2 2 and Job 1.6 brings that out. So he's created and he's also a spirit being. So the spirit created being with responsibilities in some way, which we can't define, but the Bible's not clear, so I'm not going to begin to speculate what he was aware of and what he wasn't aware of, but he was evidently somehow moved to respond with free will because angels mm-hmm. as well as men are free will agents. He made a decision to respond in a different way, adverse to God's plan. And in Ezekiel 28, it formed iniquity in his heart, which stunning to me which is off topic slightly, is God knew that and allowed it to happen. You either got to be incredibly stupid or incredibly confident Mm. that one of the most powerful beings in heaven exists with that in his heart. God let that happen, but that's for a different day. So his beginning was evidently he was very well trusted by God. What's shocking about this is God knew he would turn and gave him responsibility anyway. We often joke about why would God give Judas, Jesus give Judas so much responsibility knowing he would turn on him. How much more God the Father giving responsibility to Lucifer knowing he would turn. So he gives this responsibility to him and with his responsibility comes influence as the two are often married together. So if, with this influence because of his response to what he figured, God, his adverse response obviously to God's plan He began to, it wasn't so much, we often say, how does Lucifer become the enemy of God? Actually, he decided to make God his enemy. That's a much more apropos way to say it. God never made Lucifer his enemy. Lucifer made God his enemy. And it's the same thing with us as believers. We make a decision towards God in Romans chapter 1, rather than God makes a decision towards us. But Lucifer made this position in his heart to make God his enemy because of what he was exposed to and because of what he saw. And then he decided not to be alone. He decided to, there's a beautiful word in, the, in Ezekiel, the word is merchandising. Um, mm-hmm. And it literally means, the King James word, it literally means to go around and to market. Like Lucifer went around to the angelic coast using the influence that he had connected to his responsibility. And he used his influence beyond his responsibility in an untoward way to convince the angelic hosts that God's plan was against them. The only way that they would be able that, that he could convince them, and I don't know what he said because the scriptures doesn't say, but the only way that they could look at God and choose Lucifer would be that if Lucifer could convince them that the plan that the God they were looking at was uh, was anti-angel or unfair to them. He was so persuasive. This gives you the measure of his influence. One third of the angelic host followed him. Followed him. Yeah. It's credible to me, Pastor. They mm-hmm. looked to God and said, that's why sometimes God people say, well, if Christ was alive and I saw him, I would find, no, you wouldn't. It wouldn't take much to turn your heart. It no. wouldn't. Didn't take much to sell me an auric vacuum cleaner either. My <laughs> wife can tell that story. Had to take out a little loan to buy it too, wow. 500 and some dollars. So uh, Satan had something to sell. Uh, they wasn't bought vacuum it. cleaners. <laughs> wasn't vacuum cleaners either. He had something to sell, and it became, uh, you know, it became, um, you know, it became. Uh, what Wait. is it? Here's here's the way I look at it. Okay, okay. Um, let's say. Okay, if uh, I think you're right about this, since he trafficked, not mm-hmm. trafficked. But this is before the fall and the pre-fall. Mm-hmm. He had, um, you know, he had privilege. Mm-hmm. He had privilege to hear the things that the Trinity was talking about. Okay. So I think you're right about that. I think that's a, a fair, uh, not, if there's anything like, uh, that's a fair assumption, this might be one, is that, um, you know, all of a sudden, you know, as, according to Psalm 8, these human beings made of clay, not bright and glorious beings, but jars of clay filled with God, mm-hmm. are suddenly given a place of honor. And, and we know from Hebrews that, uh, the host are to serve mm-hmm. the redeemed. Yes. And so man, lower than the angels, made of stuff that, you know, that, you know, dirt, made yes. of dirt is elevated. So they become the middle managers uh. and 
the lower managers, the mm-hmm. the employer, the employee class is that. So this could be the whole iniquity. What do you mean? Look at us. Look sure. at what we are. Look at the brightness of our being. Mm-hmm. And then you're going to make these, you know, and uh, maybe it's all related. It could be like that. You can see, you could see, because uh, we know how our own hearts work. You sure. know, someone gets, someone gets to do this and then we start uh, on a path of jealousy and then envy becomes the rottenness to our bones. It's the same thing. The jealousy of yes. what God was giving to human beings uh, ate them up. Is that fair? I think that's fair in the sense that um, I, you said Psalm 8 verse 4, who, who is God, that, who is man that God would be mindful of him? Mm-hmm. The son of man that he would come visit him. If there's any part of that that Lucifer had access to in his plan, in God's plan, I could see as an angel how I would be insecure about that. Yes. I, would, I, would live, I would live comparatively, more specifically maybe in relative righteousness depending upon how much I was exposed to it. But you can see how evil entered his heart. And that's very good to say. Let's make this distinction again. Satan is not the symbol of evil, okay? Satan is actually the first victim of evil. If I could say it that way, that might be controversial. A victim of his own design. Yes, of his own design. Because by nature, he wasn't created evil. No. That's the thing. That's why I'm saying he's the first victim of evil, his own. And, all, and, and frankly, for the human race, we're the first victim of our own evil. It's the same thing that applies to us. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not the devil. It's not other people. It's me. And it happened to him. And what's shocking is that it happened in a perfect environment. There was no other, there was nothing around him, no stimuli that could suggest evil. But his response is what sowed the seed. Sowed the seed. And it's the same thing in the garden. There was nothing with Adam, around Adam and Eve that would suggest evil, but there was something in her perfect heart at the time. There was because of free will, there's always an opportunity for evil because of free will. The same reason why Eve fell is the same reason why Lucifer could fall because of free will, the opportunity to choose and to choose wrongly and respond wrongly to what I'm exposed to. So somehow you can see how possibly the most powerful angel in heaven, possibly the greatest created being, under the Trinity, could suddenly make God his enemy. Mm. And that's who he was. That's, that's who he was, and that's what he became. And then here's what happens. Once you have this in your mind, it becomes the self-fulfilling prophecy that if I describe God's plan according to my interpretation, which is yeah. what he did, he trafficked his interpretation of God's plan, I have to keep proving that. Yeah. And right now, this is what this is the devil's plan. God's plan is different. Satan's plan is to prove the corruption of God's plan. That God's plan is not what he says it is. And every angel that listened to me, I have a plan to show you who God really is. Mm-hmm. And that's what's happening today. We know that uh in this present time, we know he goes to the first Peter 5, 8, going around the earth, seeking whom he may devour. We know that he has a personal problem with man because man is the target of God's plan and God's plan that favors man is going to automatically be anti-angel. Like you said, all of a sudden they should be serving us. Now we're serving them. Um, so now this prince of the power of the air in Ephesians 2.2 2, and the God of this world in 2 Corinthians 4.4 4, has one job to prove that God's plan doesn't work and is, is, is exactly the way he described it in heaven. He is literally trying to prove a case that started in the ears of the angelic host in eternity past. Mm. Wow. Uh, This is the Grace Hour. You're watching us uh, on one of these platforms, uh, Facebook Live, YouTube Live. Uh, Welcome to this uh, program, and uh, this is a taped program today, uh, January 2nd. Uh, Happy New Year again. If you didn't hear us at the opening of the program, we're starting 2023. With a discussion, Pastor Ronaldo Brown and myself, Pastor Steve Andrelonis, we're talking about uh, the devil, Satan, who he is, and uh, Pastor Ronaldo brought up a significant point. Uh, it's really becoming uh, very uh, passe to believe in Satan as an actual person or actual being with personality, and uh, you know this is the naive thing that is sweeping through people. It's a lack of Bible understanding. Because when you get to the book of Job, which is one of the earliest 
pieces of writing mm-hmm. that we have in the biblical canon, uh, the whole first part of it is talking about a man who's very prayerful, very mindful of his family, and also very blessed, uh, being accused mm-hmm. of uh, just really worshiping God for all that he can get. And this is the accusation of Satan. And so this is really the way Satan operates in in uh, in what we see in the Bible, is that he makes accusations. Mm-hmm. He makes accusations about God to man. He makes accusations about man before the Lord. Uh, but we know that uh, with this accusation in Job 1 and then Job chapter 2, in both of these cases, uh, Job... Uh, did not turn himself over to evil mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, and buy into, uh, he did not curse God. He questioned God. He complained to God. He lamented to God again and again and again, all through these chapters, even when he was being, uh, what, what, what's the right thing, getting tortured counsel from his friends, so-called friends in that point. Uh, Job uh, did not curse God, which is what Satan's accusation was. Now, mm-hmm. let's put this uh, into perspective, I think uh, maybe you could put this into perspective, like the accusation program of Satan. It's sure. really the thing that drives all evil. Yes, I, I, let's let's do two things. Let's number one, once again, let's separate evil from Satan. Satan's not the only cause of evil. Let's be careful of that. My flesh, mm-hmm. the world system. There are three major sources of evil in today's world. The, the excuse that the devil made me do it is not only valid, it's immature. Yeah, Flip Wilson, Geraldine. Yes. She was like this yes. caricature of like, a, a, you know. A, too long. You know, too, a caricature of a, some woman in a in a too, urban church or yes. something like that, right? Geraldine, the yes. devil made me do it. It's yeah, always of the course. Devil, it was funny. But it's too long the church. Yeah. Christians yeah. have let Hollywood describe Satan to us. Exactly. Too long. Yeah, we've let we've let pop culture, media, movies, the world describe a very key factor. One of the cardinal doctrines of the church, one of the fundamental doctrines of the church, is the doctrine of Satan. Yes, it's it's right there. There's any systematic theology that does not have that doctrine is incomplete, and it's heretical to not believe in the devil because the Bible says it. It says he has an intellect. In 2 Corinthians 11, 3, he's got emotions in Revelation 12, 17. He has a will in 2 Timothy 2, 26. Intellect, emotion, will, he's a person, qualifies as a person. He's not a spirit. He's not a symbol. He's not a face. He's a person, and he's a major contributor towards evil in my life. But in all honesty, there's a lot of evil in my life, and it ain't the devil. It's me. It's my flesh. It's my own corrupted nature that makes decisions that are diametrically opposed to God and the things of God. But what he does is what he did in the garden. He stimulates me and suggests to me, which is interesting about the the names of Satan. They're roughly, I want to say, over 60. Over 50% of the names of Satan involve the mouth. Mm. Over 50%. Which means his number one modus operandi, his number one tactic that he's going to use against the church, besides convincing us that it doesn't exist, um, is to suggest, to project, to accuse, to blame, to indict, to reframe perspective. He uses, he's been honing these tools for, century, for, for millennia. He did that with the angels. He had nothing tangible in his hand to give the angelic host, but with the power of his mouth, he persuaded one-third of the angelic host to follow him. If he could, if he could convince perfect angels to follow him. How much more you and me? But uh, D- D.L. Moody said it best. I believe this, the, the devil exists for two reasons. Number one, the Bible says so. And number two, I've done business with him. <laughs> That's D.L. Moody. Uh, it, it's, it's like uh, A.W. Tozer said, the devil is a better theologian than any of us, and he's still a devil. I want you to think about that for a second. There's things that we should know about. He knows about them better. And sadly, one of the things we don't know about is him. He hides in plain sight. And though the church says the devil, the devil, the devil, we always point to evil, 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 sin, 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 and we don't understand that there's a major contributor that's involved. But once again, I want to reiterate this again. He's not the cause of all evil. 
but he's a major contributor towards evil. He promotes it. Uh, he blinds minds in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Uh, he, uh, he tempts, uh, he deceives. Uh, John 8, 44, he lies, he's a murderer. Um, uh, he roars, he intimidates, he, 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 he deceives, he traps. He takes people captive at their will. 2 Timothy 2.26 is an amazing verse. It says he takes people captive at his will. Mm. He literally takes his time. It's kind of like when he went to tempt Jesus in Matthew 4. He said he'll come back for a more convenient time. Like he's actually sitting back and waiting. And this, let's be aware of this also too. As he functions in his plan to convince us to God, that we're not worthy of whatever plan he has for us and to convince God to us that he's not who he says he is. He was to tell both sides that neither one of us is who is worthy of any kind of plan of redemption. While he's dissuading both sides, he's using tools and weapons of persuasion. Um, he's using uh, deception. Uh, he's, he's, he's not omnipresent. He can't be everywhere present, but he has an army of demons that he uses Throughout the world, in Ephesians chapter 6, 6 through 12, with a vast communication system that functions very well together. There's no disunity in, in, in hell, in the demons, and the devil. They're united in what they do. There's no, discre there's no discrepancy. There's no adversarial relationship. There's no competition, which is scary. There's no competition. He's not, omnip he's not omnipowerful. He needs God's permission to do whatever he does. It needs to be authorized by God. And in 2 Timothy 3, 12 and 13, he will increase in authority. The word there talks about evil getting stronger. The word there for strength is the word of authority. He will increase in his authority. He'll have the authority to do things that today that he didn't have authority to do 25 years ago. And that's why you see the manifestations of evil growing and growing because he's getting more authority. And God is allowing that according to his plan. But he's, he's not omnipotent but he has a waxing power. Mm. Number three, he's not all knowledge. He's not, he's, not he's not omniscient. He doesn't know what you think. He cannot read minds. He doesn't know when you're going to die. Hebrews 9, 27, only God knows that. There's large portions of information he has no clue about. But he's a good student, and he's had a whole lot of practice. He's had a whole lot of practice. He's refined this thing for 10, 15, possibly 8,000 years. So he's, what he's been doing works. He's been tracking the church since its inception, since, it, since its prophetic beginning. So he's currently working, again, two things, to speak to the church, speak to the world about God in a, in, in a corrupted way and speak to God about the world in a corrupted way. And you find that in Job chapter 1 and you find that in Revelation chapter 12 and 1 Peter chapter 5, 7 through 8. Um, he makes war. He performs miracles. Um, he has inc incredible knowledge. Um, he, he deceives. He lies. Uh, he has organizational ability, which is shocking, the level of organization that he has between his demons and, and hell. Um, mm. He does tempt, and there's an interesting mystery about the way he tempts. tempts he studies your life, basically. He studies the government. Uh, he can cause miracles. He can cause physical suffering. Um, he has the ability to put suffering on people as God allows him to take it away. He works in wicked. He works through wicked people. Um, there's a lot of personal connection he has with his plan. Um, but I will also say this again. He is accountable. He's accountable now. He's accountable in the future. He's accountable to God the Father. He cannot exist beyond the permission of the plan of God in the time that he operates. Mm. meaning he has more permission in certain areas at certain times. Um, God has the ability to rein him in. I, I said it earlier, I'll say it again. Uh, John Wesley said it best. He may be the devil, but he's God's devil. He is a dog on a leash. No matter how much he yells and barks, he's a dog on a leash. He's going to grow in power toward the end of the church age, at the end of the church age, when the tribulation period begins through this ungodly trinity, which is the Antichrist mimicking the Jesus Christ, um, the devil himself mimicking God the Father, and the false prophet mimicking, mimicking the Holy Spirit. There'll be an unholy trinity reigning on the earth for seven years. 
And then at the end of that period, there'll be a response by God. The devil himself will be cast into the abyss. He'll sit there into the abyss for a thousand years during the millennial reign. Then he'll be released again for a short time in Revelation 27 through 10. He'll launch one final major assault against God himself. He'll be He'll lose that assault, and then in Revelation 20, verse 10, he'll be cast in a lake of fire where he will not be eliminated. He will not die, but he will be tormented day and night in the lake of fire. Mm. That yeah. is his timeline. Really. Yeah. He knows his time is short. This yes. is why he rages. So why is he so active right now? Because his time is limited. He doesn't have all knowledge as mm -hmm. the point you made. I find it interesting when we read through Ezekiel 28, we find these words here about uh, Satan. Mm. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty, corrupted yourself by the wisdom of reason, mm -hmm. your brightness. But then it says this, uh, verse 18, Ezekiel 28, it says, you have defiled your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquity, you were a sanctuary. What is a sanctuary? Hmm. The devil was a sanctuary. It was a place for the glory of God to be revealed. He was a place for the glory of God to be revealed the same way that we are now that the presence of the Holy Spirit lives in us. Okay. Then it continues. It says, you defiled the sanctuaries by your traffic, the iniquity of your traffic, your merchandising. Then it says this, interesting, which speaks to the idea of the iniquity, something coming mm -hmm. from out. And it says that God will bring forth the fire from the midst of thee, and it shall devour thee. And I will bring you to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all of them who behold thee. And all they that know you, all they that know you uh, will see you, uh, see your collapse. Mm -hmm. And then there'll be, like you said, the lake of fire will be his final destination because everything that God makes is eternal. I don't think we realize this, that, you know, we seem to think of things being evaporated and reduced to nothing, but uh, every molecule, every atom, every, whatever the, the minute parts of atoms are, uh, they are all eternal because they came from the voice of God spoken into existence. But this is things, there's a fire in the midst of Satan that is raging and it will eventually devour him, mm -hmm. sort of like, right? You could say something to this, yeah. sort of like what's in, involved in all of us. C.S. Lewis said, like, it's either, uh, you know, it's either thy will be done or my will be done. Mm -hmm. And if you let my will be done, then you will implode, basically. It's mm. like uh, human beings. And uh, it seems like anything that, uh, you know, the beings that God gave this rationality to, the ability to respond to him, and uh, that's uh, and have an exchange with him when they turn inward on themselves and only devote themselves uh, to themselves. Mm -hmm. Then this is the collapse that happens. Yeah, it's like the the, the privilege of free will becomes oh, becomes weaponized against me, mm. and I literally use my free Good will point. instead of yeah. targeting it, to, which is it is divine purpose to know God. I use my free will to know myself. Mm. Uh, Jeremiah 10, 23, it's not within a man to know himself, yet I try. Yes. Because there's a personal glory. For, and this is what glory, this is what glory and pride hide, hides under. It hides under curiosity. I'm curious about me. So because I'm curious about me, I lose my interest in God, and then that's what happens. And I guess at Lucifer's level, the, possibly the most gifted of all the angels, the highest created angel, and obviously above men, there wasn't much for him to be curious about except for what was above him. Maybe because of where he was, the temptation was great to want to, I will, the above. But you know what's interesting, Pastor Steve? In this America, 2023, coming into this new year, we are an achievement-driven, self-reliant, independent people. Mm -hmm. So when you present a, a, a concept, not even a principle, a concept, that my life could be impacted by unseen forces such as a god or a devil, I'm soft to that. I, I don't believe in that. I mean, and then all these principles of God and, uh, and, and the devil, Hollywood has softened that. It yeah. has made it weaker. It's not so. I, I grew up in a generation where to talk about things like God and talk about the devil, you would tremble. Because these things were larger than life. They were like massive. It was like you're talking about the devil. You said his name not in fear, but you said it in like 
rep- you were careful because you're dealing with a supernatural, amazing thing. Now we use it like a, a punchline. We use it like, hey, it's just that we become careless with it so that we've almost dismissed it. So now there really isn't no devil. It's just a myth. I mean, come on. I, my life is my own. I go where I go. There's no devil involved. It's just me making bad choices. There's the idea of, an, of a powerful, unseen force working against me, against who I am, despising me, hating me, only restrained by a loving God, that's completely wrong. Yeah. So it's like Satan, instead of being a person, becomes a byline or a punchline for everything wrong in my life. And it, it's filtered into the church. People that don't know much. One guy said to me, and I will not say where and when I was in a church, and someone said to me, oh, the devil is a, a black guy who lives, who lives uh, on a planet and he just comes and does bad things on the earth. Mm. This is a Christian believer. Wow. I said to him, where did you get that in the Bible? He said to me, oh, I, I just thought about it. Well, first of all, who told you truth starts from you? That's why I need a Bible-based. That's a great practice for me as a believer is get into my Bible and learn the foundational truth of my Christian foundation. A believer should know what they believe, why they believe it, and where is it found. No matter where your maturity is with God, where, what you believe, where you believe it, what you believe, why you believe it, and where is it found. And the devil fits in that group. It's one of the cardinal doctrines of the Bible. And sadly, sadly, six out of ten believers do not believe the devil. These are Christians, evangelical, do not believe the devil exists. And he operates invisibly. Uh, the, a French poet said this, the finest trick of the devil is to persuade you that he doesn't exist. Mm. He can work with anonymity. He can work right. in broad daylight, and mm-hmm. you have no idea. I can remember being in Africa, and it was interesting to me. I saw some visual signs of demonic. I saw a guy take a machete, slice his forearm seven times, blood shoots out, take sand from the ground, wipe his arm, and it was gone. Mm. I blew my mind. It's interesting there because the third world is not so intellectual. Um, Satan has to manifest more demonstratively. It's got to be visual. But over here in the first world, we're so dumbed down by the internet and movies, mm. you can do all kind of that stuff, and we figure there's some kind of a trick. So he's got to be more sophisticated here. So mm. rather here, he doesn't convince, he doesn't have to use magic. He can just convince us that he doesn't exist. But he has different tactics of manifestation to operate, once again, to attack God's people and to attack the human race and to attack God. Yeah, right? that's it, yeah. Well, as we come circle the runway here getting prepared to land our program today uh like you said simplicity is important being simple concerning evil we don't want to be sophisticated Mm -hmm. people in the areas of evil we don't want to uh you said like a a good solid diet of bible understanding is uh, what you're going to do so one part of the thing that we we would be remiss if we didn't bring people to One of the great showdowns. We know about Job's accusation uh, from Satan to God. And then, but uh, there's also this whole picture in the book of Zechariah of Joshua, a high priest, Mm -hmm. wearing filthy garments, being accused, and also being given a robe of righteousness Mm -hmm. from Christ. Mm -hmm. And so this is. This is the, you know, okay, Satan, we've already defined where Satan's going. Okay, sure. get that in your mind if you're watching us today. You've listened to our conversation. Get that in your mind. Uh, the fire that's burning in Satan will eventually implode on himself. He'll be ashes, and he'll be sent to the lake of fire, never to bother us again. We wish that day would come tomorrow. Uh, but uh, that's a day that's coming. But also, in this picture, it shows Joshua the high priest, a religious leader, He's wearing filthy garments, but he is a brand plucked from the fire. Mm -hmm. All of us who have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ are brands plucked from the fire. Regardless of what kind of deception Satan is bringing into people's lives to make us feel unworthy and unholy, this story in Zechariah says, no, take his filthy garments, put a crown on him. This accusation As true as it is, it doesn't change the dynamic that I have paid for his sins Mm -hmm. and that I give him a new garment. He can wear my garment. Mm -hmm. And I think 
let's end on an upswing. <laughs> well, we're wearing the rope. Well, the most important thing, we said it earlier, I'm wise to the good. Yes. In other words, I can talk about the mystery of iniquity in Second Thessalonians chapter 2, but I can also talk about the mystery of godliness in First Thess- First Timothy 3.16. And I would be, I would be well-focused to think on the mystery of godliness and how God is to, and be wise to that, to think about that. But I do not want to be remiss and be ignorant of the reality of Satan, the reality mm. of demons, the reality of hell. We said again, it's not a fear, it's an awareness. It's an awareness because then that's part of walking circumspectly in Ephesians chapter 5, 15 through 17. Um, when you walk circumspectly, you're not walking to not fall, but you're aware that you could fall. Galatians talks about take heed lest you fall. You're being consciously careful. You're not being spiritually careless. Uh, and I find a lot of believers play with demonic things like Wiccan, Ouija board. You play with things because you're being careless and mm. you underestimate the power of evil. You underestimate that there's a devil. But I, but I want to end on the up note and say with you again, we don't fear the devil. We're hitting Christ in 1 John chapter 5. The wicked one touches us not. But we're not blind and we're not ignorant and we're not unaware. We're vigilant. Be Amen. vigilant in these days. Be vigilant. Be aware. There is a devil. Be, be aware of who, you, who he is. Like C.S. Lewis said, I don't, want the un, I don't want the unfair balance of being ignorant and I don't want the unfair balance of being focused on him every day. That's not our walk with God. Amen. Well, you've been listening to this discussion here on this uh, second day of January. Thank you for being with us, uh, watching the Grace Hour. Pastor Ronaldo, thank you uh, for being with me. We just want to encourage you. Uh, yes, uh, if you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, please uh, start this new year off right by believing on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Call upon him and be saved. And that the battle belongs to the Lord. Remember, no war was won by one battle, but the battles belong to the Lord. And uh, as it says in the Chronicles, if you uh, marching into a battle, praise ye the Lord for his mercy endures forever. Regardless of what you may be thinking or deceived into thinking about who you are or what you've done, the mercy of God is forever. It endures forever, uh, regardless of what kind of deception Satan might want to introduce. So this week will be uh, devoted to talking about these things. Uh, join us every day if you can. Uh, if you missed something, again, we said you can see it again at uh, gracehour.org, YouTube, Facebook, and also the podcast is on Apple, Google, Spotify, Amazon, iHeartRadio, Audible, and Stitcher. So thank you for being a part of the Grace Hour. I'm Pastor Steve Andrelonis for Pastor Ronaldo Brown saying have a great Monday. Monday.